What motive for murder would you consider the most trivial? Betrayal, jealousy, or money? Don't rush to answer. This is a tricky question. After all, a jealous person might turn out to be greedy and an unfaithful wife may burn with jealousy herself. When in a love triangle, each person has their own motive for murder, it won't be easy for the police to figure it out. And then even a killer who no one would dare to call very smart will manage to lead the investigation for 467 days. Growing up in Amarillo, Texas, Robin knew exactly what she wanted in life, even as a child. She wanted to stay at home and take care of her children while her husband provided for the family. Her parents, both military veterans, had a happy marriage that lasted for 40 years, and she dreamed of having a similar relationship. However, things didn't go as planned because she often chose the wrong partners and avoided the good ones as if they were a danger. But above all, Robin feared being alone. She hated being alone, and she was afraid of being alone. Fortunately, thanks to her sociable nature, she got a job as a waitress in a restaurant where there was no shortage of attention from men. And so one evening in 2003, at the age of 22, Robin met a wonderful young man named Jeremy David Spielbauer. Though everyone simply called him J.D., 21-year-old J.D. was gentle, caring, and exceptionally polite. He served in the Marine Corps and had been deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. He also found work as a mechanic in civilian life. Needless to say, Robin fell head over heels in love with him. Just two months later, she joyfully announced to her parents that she and J.D. were expecting a child. Her parents had only just learned that she was dating someone, but they chose not to argue. Robin moved into J.D.'s and his mother's house. After the birth of their daughter, they decided to get married. Soon, their second daughter was born. However, as is often the case, financial difficulties made life increasingly challenging for the growing family, and conflicts became inevitable. Then, to the surprise of their friends and family, the family began attending the local church about three times a week. There, they made new acquaintances, including a young mother of two, Katie. The girls quickly became friends, but Robin's friend Aaron House looked with suspicion upon J.D.'s newfound religious devotion. She believed that their church attendance was a more trivial reason, a desire to see Katie more often. Unfortunately, she was right. Robin stubbornly turned a blind eye to everything until the day her husband moved in with his lover. Approximately eight years into their marriage, Robin filed for divorce and returned to live with her parents. J.D. and Katie got married on November 10th, the founding day of the Marine Corps. Now, J.D. helped Katie raise her two children, but it was clear that Robin hadn't forgotten her ex-husband until she became interested in Jared. It was evident that the young man genuinely liked Robin, and her friends, especially Aaron, were very happy for her. Robin at last regained her old self, rejoiced, and smiled happily, just like before. It seemed like a happy family and a cozy nest were on the horizon for the girl. But this glimmer of hope quickly dimmed one night in April 2014 when Robin got into her car and drove away, never to return home. On the morning of April 8, 2014, Robin's mother noticed her daughter was missing. She assumed that she had stayed with one of her friends, as she had done in the past, and felt somewhat irritated because she needed to go to work and didn't know who would take her grandchild to school. At that moment, it didn't even occur to her that something might have happened to her daughter. On the same day, around noon, a local businessman was driving on the highway when he turned onto Helium Road, and three girls ran towards him shouting, She's dead! She's dead! The man contacted the rescue service after the girls told him that they had seen a black Chevrolet Tahoe with a girl lying near the rear wheel. She wasn't breathing and wasn't moving. The officers who arrived at the scene concluded that the poor girl had been there for several hours and had suffered a blow to the head with a blunt object. She had no identification, wallet, or phone with her. However, the license plate of the vehicle helped identify the victim as Robin Spilbauer. Robin's parents had to break the terrible news to her daughters and her ex-husband. J.D. couldn't believe what had happened and couldn't hold back his tears. He immediately went to the family to support the children and his former in-laws. At the same time, the investigators were examining the crime scene. One unusual detail they noticed was the damage to the car's glass. The rear right door's glass had chips and bright pink paint marks. What did this suggest? It indicated that someone had struck the car's glass with a heavy and pink object. However, the detectives had no idea what significance this discovery would have in their investigation. Therefore, they began questioning Robin's acquaintances. Her boyfriend Jared stated that after work, he went home, played video games, and went to sleep. 
JD also claimed that he was at home, had two glasses of beer, and fell asleep. He hadn't come anywhere near Helium Road that evening and had no idea where Robin might have gone, why, or with whom. However, his phone told a completely different story. According to his text messages, he and his ex-wife were planning to meet that evening. The man had to admit that his wife had gone to her friend's place with their son. He had arranged to meet Robin at his home to discuss their children and wanted his uncle to be there in case his wife returned early. However, he forgot about the meeting and simply fell asleep on the couch after his uncle left. He woke up shortly before 10 p.m. with a strange, oppressive feeling. JD messaged his wife and his uncle, asking if everything was okay. At 10.18, he also messaged Robin, but she didn't respond. He tried calling her, but it went to voicemail. Just a few minutes after JD called his ex-wife, Katie arrived at the house. JD's uncle, who had returned to calm his agitated nephew, confirmed that she arrived around 10.20. They talked for a bit, as JD was still feeling uneasy. The detectives noticed that JD seemed to be trying to hint at something and directly stated that he was raising many suspicions. In response, the man claimed that he had his own suspicions but didn't specify what they were. The investigators had no doubt that JD was hiding something, and as they delved into his life, they discovered what it could be. JD had been married to Robin, but he had an affair with Katie. He then divorced Robin, married Katie, and started a new affair, this time with Robin. JD claimed they maintained friendly relations for the sake of the children, but Katie suspected there was more between him and his ex-wife. JD and Katie argued nearly every day, and Robin found it amusing. She wanted Katie to take her own medicine. The two women fought for a man they both considered a traitor, and what made him worth fighting for remained a mystery. Robin's friend Aaron even recalled an incident in 2013 when Robin came to Katie's house to pick up the girls. Katie grabbed and pushed her down the stairs, climbed on top, and started beating her. Robin managed to push her off. When Aaron heard about this, she warned her friend not to be alone with Katie because she was one of those crazies who could kill her. Five months after that fight, Robin was dead. The investigators, of course, spoke with Katie. She admitted not liking Robin, but claimed she never threatened her. However, she stumbled on the same issue her husband did, her own text messages, and not just one or two messages. In the four days leading up to the murder, Katie sent her husband 336 angry messages. It was clear that she was furious and struggling to find a way to vent her anger. Less than an hour before the murder, she sent the following message to her husband. My dreams of a happy family have evaporated. I won't force you to continue bearing this burden. You started it, whether you want to believe it or not. I will end it. Statements like these, in the eyes of the investigators, turned the jealous wife into a murder suspect. However, Katie had not only a motive, but also an alibi. She and her son spent the evening at her friend Savannah Guineas' house. They left around 10 p.m. and returned home at 10.20, which was confirmed by J.D. and his uncle. Furthermore, there was no evidence connecting her to the crime scene, at least not at that point. On the same day that investigators were interrogating Katie, the forensic expert conducted an autopsy on Robin. At the crime scene, it appeared that she had died from a severe blow to the head with a blunt object, but the autopsy revealed something more. A 22 caliber bullet had been fired into the back of the victim's head. Now the police began searching for the weapon. Robin's parents, who lived just a few houses away from Katie and JD, watched as the police conducted a search in their former son-in-law's home. The family had an entire arsenal in the house, which was quite common for Texas. However, one small detail caught a lot of attention, a pistol with a bright pink frame, the same caliber as the bullet that killed Robin. A piece of plastic had broken off the pistol. Therefore, the investigators returned to the crime scene and combed the area around where they found the car. They discovered a 22 caliber shell casing and two bright pink plastic fragments that obviously matched the pistol. What was particularly intriguing was that before they found the weapon, but after the murder, the investigators had browsed Katie's Facebook page and found a photo of her shooting the very same pink pistol. However, before they could realize the significance of this discovery, she deleted the photo. It seemed like Katie didn't want the police to know about the weapon. But why? Detectives took a closer look at where she was at the time of the murder. You may remember, she had an alibi. She and her son spent the evening with Savannah's family and left at 10 p.m. However, Savannah told them that Katie and her son had left at 9.50 or around that time. Just 10 minutes, but they were crucial. 
It only takes from three to five minutes to drive from Savannah's house to Helium Road. These ten minutes cast doubt on Katie's alibi, and her best friend was the one who brought it to light. There was more. At 10.13, Katie's phone pinged at a tower that could be considered close to both Savannah's house and the crime scene. This meant that Katie had the means, opportunity, and motive to commit the murder. The police believed they had everything they needed for an arrest. They arrested Katie in front of her 12-year-old son, Diego. By the way, as all witnesses confirmed, Katie was with her son the entire evening. Wouldn't he have noticed if his mother had stopped the car in the middle of a field, had an argument with someone, and then committed a murder? Especially since Robin had not only been shot, but also struck with a blunt object on the head. The teenager surely would have noticed. But when he was questioned, he said that all he remembered was sitting in the car with his mom and playing games on his phone while they drove around the city. Thus, on April 11, 2014, just four days after the murder, the investigators informed Robin's parents about the arrest. Robin's loved ones lost a daughter and a friend. But the consolation for them was that the person responsible for her death, Katie Spilebauer, was behind bars. Is the case closed? Not quite. Katie remained in jail, unable to post bail, while investigators and District Attorney James Farron built their case against her. They soon received assistance from an unexpected source. J.D. came to the police station and stated something he had maintained all along. He had been at home with his uncle when he received a message from Robin proposing a meetup on Helium Road. This time, J.D. added to his story by saying that just after 9 p.m., Katie returned home. She was in a bad mood and started an argument. J.D., not wanting to fight, went to his bedroom and lay down. When he woke up, he found that his wife had left in his car. That was when a terrible feeling of dread overcame him, and he decided to check if everything was all right. J.D. and his uncle received responses from Katie, confirming everything was fine, but there was no response from Robin. When the detectives asked J.D. why he decided to tell them about this now, he explained that the thought of his wife being involved in Robin's murder was driving him insane. The investigators challenged J.D.'s story, which contradicted phone records available to the police. J.D.'s phone pinged at 9.23 while he was on his way to the crime scene. J.D. then explained that someone else had taken his phone and his car. It was Katie. She saw his messages with his lover and took his phone, his car, and went to confront Robin. But why did Katie hit the car's rear right window with a gun? The detectives were convinced that it was likely the lovers had met on Helium Road, sitting in the back seat of the car when Katie arrived. She fired her gun before J.D. could react, and now he was torn between his loyalty to Katie and his desire for justice for Robin. After a few more days, J.D. finally agreed to tell everything. J.D. and Robin had met on Helium Road, sitting in the car and just talking about the kids. When they noticed headlights approaching, they heard a loud knock on the window, obviously not made by a fist. J.D. opened the door, and it was Katie. The girls immediately started arguing. J.D. demanded they stop fighting and reassured Katie that they were just talking about the children. He then went to his car and drove home, convinced that Katie would follow him. But he was wrong, so he sent two text messages, asking if everything was okay. J.D. explained that he hadn't told anyone earlier because he didn't want to believe it, as he still loved Katie, but now it was all over. He filed for divorce and never visited his wife in jail, as she was going to be there for a long time unless she could prove her innocence. When investigators took on the case, it seemed simple and straightforward. It took them four days to link Katie to the murder. The prosecutor believed that after some time in jail, Katie would confess. However, even her husband's admission didn't help. Katie demanded a polygraph test. The police provided her with that opportunity and she took another one. She failed it miserably, but it didn't break her. She still refused to confess. Katie didn't deny her animosity towards her rival, but claimed she would never kill her or arrange someone else to commit murder. The reason lay in her tragic upbringing. Her father died when she was two, and she buried her mother at 18. Knowing the hardships of growing up without parents, she would never do such a thing to Robin's children. All the evidence against Katie was circumstantial, and they needed something more solid. That's when a breakthrough happened. In the prosecutor's office, someone mentioned a case where smartphones could leave digital footprints when connecting to Wi-Fi networks. Katie's phone had its Wi-Fi turned off, but her son Diego's phone had it on. This meant that investigators could track Diego's every move and consequently, that of his mother that night. Since all the witnesses consistently stated that the teenager was always with his mother, 
Tracing Diego's phone could lead them to Katie. The prosecutor instructed his assistants to obtain this information, and it took months to do so. When the data was finally acquired, the prosecutor met with Katie. By that time, she had spent 467 days in jail awaiting trial. The prosecutor told Katie that he considered this information the final piece needed. He was confident that it would send her to prison for life, but it turned out to be the key to her freedom, allowing her to reunite with her children. She couldn't believe it, breaking down in tears due to the overwhelming emotions. She admitted that during her time in jail, she had harbored the darkest thoughts, fearing that if she were found guilty, she would have to be carried out in a body bag. She would prefer her children to believe their mother had passed away rather than having her incarcerated for murder. Suddenly, with the snap of fingers, she was free. Within hours, the case against her was closed and she was released. A happy ending? Not quite, as if Katie was innocent. It meant that someone else got away with murder. The prosecutor publicly admitted his mistake. He realized that J.D. had outsmarted him simply because everyone underestimated him, believing he wasn't clever enough to orchestrate a murder. Although there was a small arsenal in his home, he chose the pink gun, which often jammed after the first shot, solely because it belonged to Katie. He could have disposed of it in the desert where it might never be found, but he brought it back home. Moreover, surveillance cameras captured a car similar to his near the crime scene at approximately the time of the murder. Although the face and license plate weren't visible, investigators were convinced it was J.D. behind the wheel, and no car remotely resembling Katie's was seen there. But the most significant lie he told was not about the night of the murder, but his past. J.D. had never served in the Marine Corps or any other military branch, nor had he been to Iraq or Afghanistan. All those stories were fabrications to impress women like Katie, whose parents had military ties, something that spoke volumes about his character. The prosecutor was certain that at some point before Robin's murder, she had told J.D. that she had met someone else and they would no longer be lovers. Additionally, she had expressed her desire to finally receive full child support payments. J.D.'s scheme was simple, kill Robin to get rid of her, frame Katie to eliminate her as well, and then remain financially stable while finding a younger and more agreeable girlfriend. This would solve all his problems. However, the prosecutor hesitated to press charges, and nine months later, Robin's mother called him. It turned out J.D. had asked her to do him a favor and buy him a ticket to New York, claiming he needed to go there for the weekend. Presumably, he planned to flee since it was just a short distance from New York to the Canadian border. This prompted the prosecutor to take action, but an arrest doesn't equal a conviction. That's why he took another unexpected step by inviting Katie as a witness in the case. The prosecutor was confident that his earlier mistake would now help convict J.D. Robin was killed with a pink gun, and either J.D. or Katie had to be the murderer. It was certainly not Katie. The defense argued that if Robin had been severely beaten and then shot, it pointed towards Katie as the perpetrator because both actions could have killed her, suggesting the murderer was in a state of rage. Moreover, J.D. couldn't have framed Katie easily because he wasn't smart enough for such a plan. If he wanted to frame his wife, he would have ensured that she had no alibi. J.D. could have been sentenced to death if the jury believed that the crime included a robbery because Robin's phone and wallet went missing, and later, her daughter's documents were found in J.D.'s car. However, the jury decided that this was more likely a theft than a robbery. Therefore, he was sentenced to life in prison, with the possibility of parole after April 20th, 2046, when he would be 63 years old. Justice was served for Robin, but her parents still felt the pain of the thought that their daughter's greatest fear came true when J.D. left her alone on that remote road. In January 2020, the case took an unexpected turn. The appellate court overturned J.D.'s conviction. It turned out that two jurors had formed opinions about the defendant and the case before the trial, which was not allowed by the procedure. Additionally, J.D. had complained about the performance of his lawyers. In 2021, the court found no issues with the jury selection process. However, the case was once again sent back to the appellate court to assess J.D.'s complaint about his attorneys. It's important to note that the appellate court did not conclude that the man was innocent, but rather that there was a procedural error. Even if J.D.'s trial is conducted again, Katie, who currently works at a law firm, 
has promised to be present on behalf of Robin to ensure that justice prevails once more. Katie herself has become the director of a company that helps teenagers and adults overcome emotional and physical traumas and change their lives for the better through sports.